Okay, so this is the real or not quiz. What am I looking at? Yeah, this is a game where we show people random images that are either AI generated or they are real images. And the user needs to choose whether the image that the person is seeing is a real or is a generative AI image. Is this hard? Am I going to embarrass myself? In it, front is, of it is quite difficult. I okay. would say, on average, Damn. people do a little better than random, but a lot of significant amount of people do worse than random. I'm going to say that this is artificial. Yep. Yes. Seeing the pattern on the floor, I'm going to say it's artificial. Yes. Here's a woman with oranges. Um, this looks real to me. Nope, I was wrong. <laughs> and I'm going to say this is real. OK, got that one. Last one. Here we go. This is artificial. Hey! So you did 80% correct. 80%? Yeah. All right. I'm not bad at this No, one. this is actually pretty good. It was really educational, though. Thank you for showing us. <laughs> Thank you very much. So Juan LaVista, the book is called AI for Good. You make the point very early on, as do your co-writers, that AI is nothing new. We've been interacting with it really for decades, but the last two years have felt different. What makes this moment different? I think, yeah, there's clearly with, uh, after October 2022 with ChatGPT, there was a step function. And there was a step function for two reasons. First, because large language models, that is, they were able to start answering questions. Uh, and at the beginning, we thought it was like, there was no way that we could do that, something that would be useful. Because at the end of the day, these language models, the only thing they are doing are trying to predict the next word, correct? So if, if, I, if I tell you today, this morning I woke up and I saw a beautiful blue and you need to predict the next word, if I ask a person will say, well, highly likely that's sky or it could be car or could be. That's the only thing a language model is doing. It's trying to predict the next word. So a lot of people didn't realize that we could actually use this for something like we're using ChatGPT. And now we're in a moment of generative AI where images, video, audio, all these things are possible to create using AI. And we just before took a look at the real or not quiz. Yes. I was pretty good at it. But uh, that seems to be the narrative in the media, right? Deep fakes are coming to get you. These things could impact elections. Be careful about getting scammed by AI, right? On a scale of one to 10, how much should we be freaked out by this? And is this just overly kind of negative hype? As, as, as Brad Smith mentioned in, in his book, the, any technology ha can be used as a tool or as a weapon, correct? So there, there are thousands of examples on how generative AI can help uh, from allowing people that before they couldn't have the ability to, like I can, like I tell you, like as a non-native speaker, for me it has been a game changer because I have a person, like I have literally a computer that helps me edit my my language. So for me, it's a it's a game changer. But this generative AI can be used also as a weapon in some scenarios, creating the fakes uh, or 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 deceptive images is one of those. And and of course we are concerned because this technology has becoming extremely good. And the re part of the reason why we build the, the game was to show people, because a lot of people, if you ask them, they'll say, oh, I can distinguish between a fake and a not. At the same time, for us, I think as a society, it's important to understand that generating fake imagery or fake media is also not a new problem. Um, when Photoshop became a verb by late 1990s, beginning of 2000, uh, what I also realized is that people stopped believing in these images because suddenly you say, hey, it became really easy. People were educated on the fact that people could change an image. We are a bit more concerned on the videos and the audio, particularly the audio, because first it became, they are very good. And they, they also, people are not fully aware that this technology is so good and so easy to use. So I think a fundamental aspect for society is to explain to people that this is possible. And that's the reason why we have the real or not game, is to help understand, to help people like say, hey, people will be, you will be able to create the images that look exactly like a, a real picture, or your or will be able to clone your, your voice. These are concerns that people need to understand that the technology can be used for these purposes. So there are a couple of passages in the book that struck me. The first, you saying a lot of people think 
data is the new oil, but I think data is the new code. Yes. Why don't you explain that? Yeah, so, so when we think about like coding skills, in the, in the area of code, like when, when I'm coding, I have my human intelligence that can look at a problem, describe that problem into logic, convert that logic into code that are rules. Like you are basically converting your, our intelligence into rules and you're writing those rules into code. That's basically what software development is. That's what writing code is. When we look at machine learning, we have algorithms designed by us, designed by humans, that can look at data and convert that data into rules. And those rules is like code. In many ways, we are using data as a way for us to create that code. And that's why basically I'm saying data is the new code. Algorithms are just converting that data into rules. And that's the, the one of the most important powers of AI, of machine learning, is the fact that in order for us to solve a problem, what we need is the data and a success criteria. And as, and as long as we have the enough processing power and the problem can be solved using machine learning, an algorithm will be able to convert that data into that code. So that code and that output, though, are only going to be as strong and reliable as the data that was input into it, right? Cool. And there's this right. whole notion of garbage in, garbage out, yes. right? I think it's a responsibility for anybody using this technology, where you're building an AI model or, or you're using an AI model to understand how, like, if you're building an AI model, your responsibility is to make sure that the data does not have those biases, or, or if there is biases or, or, or the data is incomplete, you make sure that people are aware of that. Let me show you an example of this. From pictures uh, of the skin, you can use AI models to detect skin cancer. A lot of those early models were trained in data sets that mainly had Caucasian, which means that they can be very good at detecting skin cancer if you're Caucasian, but if you're an African-American or Latino or Asian, likely those models will not generalize to that. And that is an important aspect that we need to understand. We need to understand if we're using some of these models. If you're building the model and if you're using these models, we need to understand how were these models trained and make sure, first, as, as a responsible organization, you need to make sure that the data is representative. But if it's not representative, you need to make sure that the people are going to be using those models understand the limitations of those models. Mm -hmm. Another line that struck me, in fact, I laughed out loud, which is probably not that common reading a book about AI, right? That's but, not, that would be the first time. <laughs> is that what you were going yeah. for? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the fact that we put a man on the moon before we put wheels on our luggage, yes. right? That's kind of funny. But it also gets to a question of a lot of this is super complicated still for a lot of people at a time when we're facing some real basic crises like yes. inflation and food insecurity and political instability in some places. How do you sort of keep the bus moving forward on this kind of progress? So two, two or three things. First, I, I, like I mentioned in the book, is, is uh, some of the things that we, we try to do our best in the lab is to make sure that our solutions are simple. Like because of that addiction to complexity, in general, people are, we, we want to look intelligent, so we want to make these solutions as complex as possible. And those are will make re really good papers, maybe really good presentations, but definitely will never make it to production. So we, we see that as a crucial problem that we need to solve, is we need to invest in simplicity. And I think, if you ask me, like, ChatGPT is a great example. Like, GPT technology in general is a great example of simplicity. Well, if you had asked me 10 years ago, do you think, do you see how there were hundreds of millions of users could be interacting with AI? I was like, how, correct? Like today we live in a world where less than 0.5% of the world know how to code, but even within that 0.5% of the world that know how to code, a very tiny fraction uses AI by coding, and even within that, even tinier, tinier fraction is focused on natural language processing. Now suddenly, thanks to the technology, people can interact with an AI model in natural language, so, so you no longer need that coding. So I think in many ways, this technology, like we need to do an effort to make it easy. I do think that technology like large language models will help us with that interaction, will help us make sure that you will not need a PhD in computer science to interact with some of that data or, or be able to solve problems. So. Last question, a prediction. AI has been evolving so rapidly over the past couple of years. Yes. How are our lives different five years from today? 
That's a great question. I, I, I think people will, I think the models will continue to improve, correct? So you will be able to interact with models like we do today, but in many ways, these models will become likely much less hallucinations, less problems, more accuracy. From that perspective, it, it will help. A lot of things will also not necessarily change. We, we are still behaving in many ways like, you know, from a, like interpersonal skills. A lot of the things that are important today will still be important in five years. And technology will help us navigate. Like for a lot of people, their life will change, correct? There's 280 million people that are blind. Now, thanks to computer vision models, for the first time, people can navigate the world and have a, a, a tool that will help them understand it and, and, and become self-sufficient, self be able to work. So for a, lot of, for a lot of people in the world, this is gonna be, it's, it's already, but it's gonna be, become even more greater big change, like a, a game changer for them. But a lot of things will also not change. Juan Levista, the book is AI for Good. Thanks so much for doing this. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much.